All right, looks like we're on air. So, David, you run the CVS YouTube channel and you have a website, uh, Christian Versus. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, it's called Catholic Versus. Oh, sorry about that. It's okay. Catholics are Christian and uh, Catholicism is the fullness of Christianity. That's the way the Catholic Church puts it. The channel is basically a podcast. It's audio only for the moment, but the basic idea is to talk to people with different worldviews, to see if I've got any blind spots, to be challenged in my faith because I don't want to believe a lie, and uh, to meet people. Uh, I love and respect all people, and I'm interested in philosophy and religion. So that that's basically what the podcast is all about. Cool. Uh, well, I'm an atheist, and I've noticed you had several conversations with atheists like Aaron Ra and Graham Opie. Um, so I define atheism as the position that there are no reasons to believe in a God. And I'd like to know what reasons you believe there are for belief in a God. Then I'd like to tell you my position on those reasons, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on my position. Sure, sounds good. The way that I came to understand that God exists is through solipsism, just through an existential encounter with the bare fact of existence. I had, through studying Western philosophy, come to believe that I am is the only reality, that I'm the only being, and essentially that I am God. And it was through reading Rene Descartes that I came out of my solipsism. And the way that he does it is he just shrugs his shoulders and says, well, of course, God is God. <laughs> so that that will not satisfy any atheist ever until that atheist is confronted with the existential encounter with the brute fact of eternal life. When you are when you are a true solipsist, you are not viewing life as an atheist. A naive realist atheist would view life, meaning that there is a material world and then molecules bump into each other and life comes from non-life. When you're a solipsist, you are life. You are confronted with the, the bald fact of existence itself. You have a direct encounter, a direct intuition with the fact that life is eternal. And you might think that that's a nice, pleasant encounter, but it's frightening. The existentialist philosophers talk about the absurdity of it, the abyss of being, and uh, how do we grapple with that? And so as a hard solipsist, I had to grapple with that. And uh, it wasn't very pleasant. It was very lonely, as you can imagine. Being the only being is a very lonely place to be. But um, I had the grace of God to take a leap of faith into monotheism, meaning that I acknowledge that I am not a God that is drunk or lost or confused or dreaming or deluded or playing a game with himself. I'm not God. God is God. And I took a leap of faith into the real world that the other exists, other minds exist, and that the material world is real and there's science and there's history and everything else. So that's one way of looking at my conversion because I was atheist for 25 years. I don't know if you know that. But I was, uh, I lost my faith at age 14. So that's sort of the short version of how philosophy took me into hard solipsism. And then, thank God, I was able to escape from hard solipsism. But there's, there's nothing very convincing there for the atheist. The only thing I could say to the atheist is that if you want to go the way that I went, which is a shortcut to monotheism, then you're going to have to really question everything. You're going to have to doubt everything. You have to be hyper-skeptical about everything, absolutely everything. And then you're left with the one fact that you cannot deny, which is, I am. So I can talk about other approaches, how to come through empirical means, using arguments from entropy, and uh, sort of work your way backwards to the first cause, which is necessarily a supernatural first cause. And we can, we can know with 100% certainty that there is a supernatural first cause which created everything out of nothing. If you want to pursue that, we can talk about that. That's my favorite way of proving the existence of God, theoretically or intellectually, but experientially, I was confronted with the fact of eternal life. All right, so I am a epistemic solipsist, so I think that the starting point for knowledge is I think, therefore I am. And then from that I go to there is some difference between my imagination and my experience. We need some methodology to differentiate between those two, and the methodology I use is science. So I agree that there has to be some necessary thing to ground the existence of everything, but I see no reason to believe that's uh, supernatural or a 
being of any kind. It could just be pantheism, an eternal, all-powerful nature of some kind that we don't know about with laws and parts of nature that we just haven't discovered yet. So I see no reason to jump from the conclusion that there must be some necessary thing to that that necessary thing is supernatural or a being in any sense. I would just ask you why you posit the existence of the material world and other beings in the first place. It seems to me like an unjustified leap of faith. I took the leap of faith because I accepted that I am not God, that God is God. But if I had not taken that leap of faith to say that I am not God and that God is God, then I would have just remained God, a disembodied intelligence. Do you understand? There is absolutely no justification whatsoever to be provided by the sciences or even by philosophy or pure reason that the other exists or that the real, so-called real world or material world exists. Because these alleged sense perceptions that we seem to have, in order to validate these alleged sense perceptions, we would need to do some sort of experiment. And those experiments rely on the very sense perceptions that we're trying to test and validate. So there is absolutely no way to validate our sense experiences. Right. But that's only if you look at it from a metaphysical perspective. I'm only looking at it from an apparent perspective. So when I imagine a unicorn, I don't see a unicorn. Would you agree with that? You can't picture a unicorn? No, no. When I am imagining a unicorn in my head, I do not see one with my sense experience in front of me. Yeah, there's a difference between imagining something that does exist and imagining something that doesn't exist. So in the case of a unicorn, I don't like that example because I don't see any reason why a unicorn couldn't exist. Oh, it could be anything. There's it's, it's just a random example I picked. So there is some difference between my imagination and my experience. So I just went from solipsism to there is some difference between my imagination and my experience. Now, we know there's lots of things that are different between these the, the imagination and experience. There's lots of things you can imagine that have nothing to do with your experience, like numbers and letters and language and imaginary things. And I can imagine myself being 10 feet tall. There's a, a big distinction between these two. And so we need some kind of methodology to differentiate. Now, the methodology I use that I've come to through a long, long epistemology uh, is science, is novel testable prediction. So I can use novel testable prediction to differentiate, is this object an object in my imagination or an object in the world I'm experiencing around me? Now, I'm going to label that the internal-external distinction. There is stuff in my head and there is stuff in, my, in the world. This doesn't prove the external world exists. I have no idea. I can't prove that. But I can prove there is some difference between my imagination and my experience, and I can label that experience the external world. So I have reason to believe the external world exists because there is some difference between my imagination and my experience. And using that same methodology of testable predictions, I can make testable predictions about if that other person has a mind, I will expect them to do this. And if those testable predictions are verified to be true, then they have met the criteria of what I define as a mind. That doesn't prove they're a mind. They could be a philosophical zombie, but they have met the empirical criterion of what I define as a mind. So I have reason to justify the external world and other minds uh, methodologically, not metaphysically. But you, you do understand that that's an arbitrary distinction you're making between the internal and the external, and it's based on an assumption, a leap of faith, that there is an actual real distinction between your imagination and your experience, because your imagination is just one form of experience, really. No, 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 no. So I'm not making a, a metaphysical distinction. I'm not saying these are two different categories of existing things. I'm just saying there is some difference between my imagination and my experience. What that difference is makes no difference at all. So like they could both be a part of my imagination, like the external world could just be a deeper part of my imagination, but it makes no difference because there's still some difference. So I can still differentiate between them. Do you actually believe in the real world the way that I do? Because now, now that I'm a Catholic, I believe that the real world exists and that you're real and that we haven't discovered any unicorns. But if, if there are any unicorns, they have an objective reality. Are you there with me or are you, you, are you unwilling to commit to that? Or is it a possibility, a probability thing for you? It's more of a probability thing for me. I look at the world from a bottom-up perspective. So I start with methodological justifications. I don't talk about metaphysics. So there could be an external world. There may not be. I can't prove it one way or the other. But my ability to differentiate between the two gives me a probabilistic assessment that there is such a thing. Okay. It's a greater than 50% in your estimation? I have no idea. The probability that only matters to me is that there is some difference between my imagination and my experience. And if you have a dream within a dream and everything meets your criteria, then you just take it as reality. Well, if I'm in a dream and I'm having a dream where I can do empirical tests in those dreams, then those things are still empirical. So the fact that it just meets the criteria of uh, empirical means that there is some difference between my imagination and my experience. 
So starting from my experience, I can tell that here's my experience. And then there's some other thing, which is over here, which is different, which is the external world, my appearance of it. It doesn't matter if that's a deeper part of a dream or if we're in a matrix or if we're in a theistic universe or a pantheistic universe. There's still some difference between these two things, no matter what you do. So if I'm starting from my experience, I can build upwards and start to add on to external, to layers of reality. And it doesn't make a difference what they are fundamentally metaphysically made of. Interesting. So my, so my question is still, what reason do I have to believe there is a God? I still don't see how to get to belief in a God. I think you do believe in God. I think you do already believe in God. I think that you aren't sure who God is. The pointed question I would ask you is, do you deny that there's a non-zero probability that you are God, or you're willing to admit that there is a possibility no matter how slight well, I guess there's a possibility no matter how slight, but I would say that based on my definition of what qualifies as a god, I would not in any sense qualify. I do, I'm not all powerful. I can't make things happen just by willing it to happen. I'm restricted by some things that I don't understand. So I, I would not qualify as my definition of a god. Yeah. And you think it's laughable to consider the possibility that maybe you just fooled yourself because uh, the Eastern religions talk about this, that it's Maya and separation and all this illusion will eventually dissolve, the mist of illusion will dissolve, and we'll find, we'll find that there is just the one unity, the one mind of God. This is the ultimate reality. There is only God, there is only heaven, and all of this separation, you over there, me over here, this is all illusion, this will all be dissolved. Are you sympathetic to that, and does it resonate with your worldview? Yeah, it's, it's a possibility. It's like it's a possibility that I could have been God and I deliberately limited myself to experience something. That's, but I find it incredibly unlikely. Just the probabilities of that are too low for it to be as reasonable as the alternatives. <laughs> okay. What about the nature of existence itself, the nature of being, the nature of life? I had an existential experience, which you can chalk up to insanity or some chemical thing, something I ate or whatever, you know, there, there are many ways of accounting for why I had a subjective experience, right? And I think that those are all legitimate concerns and critiques, some more legitimate than others, obviously. But nonetheless, I did have a subjective experience with this raw notion of being or life or existence, whatever you want to call it, this I am. And it was no longer subject to doubt when I had this encounter that life is not finite, life is infinite. That means life is unbounded, it is eternal, it has always been. Have you had an experience like that? Uh, and if not, what impression do you get when I'm speaking, even though I'm speaking in very sloppy and vague terms, what impression does it give you? Well, no, I have not had any of those kinds of experiences, uh, so I'm not exactly sure what you mean. But my first inclination towards what you're saying is that I start with my epistemology of I think therefore I am and then I need to tell they need some methodology to tell a difference between my imagination and my experience. And you said you had this experience. So what methodology do you use to differentiate that from just being one of the imaginary things as opposed to some aspect of the world outside of your imagination? Because as far as I can tell, I don't see a methodology that can identify that. A lot of people are aware of the fact that they're going to die. And if you ask them, are you going to die one day? They will say, yes, I'm going to die. But then there are all kinds of really dramatic experiences that people can have. And again, you can say it's subjective. You can chalk it up to whatever you want. But the point is that these people, if you talk to them after that experience and you say, are you aware of the fact that you're going to die? The yes that they give you now is qualitatively different from the yes they gave you before when they said, yeah, I'm going to die. Whereas now they're like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's heavy. The experience enriched them. They've come into contact with something, something which is deeply mysterious. And I would say that what they've come into contact with is life. That's what this brush with death put them into contact with. It put them in contact with God, whether they say that that's what happened or not. I would say that that's what happened. They're, these are life-changing experiences. So everyone knows they're going to die, but some people know it in a qualitatively different way, a significantly different way. So I would say it's the same thing with the question of life. Do you know that you're alive? Everyone says yes, but not many people have had the encounter that I've had I definitely think it's a possibility that there could be these other realms of reality or deeper levels of life and the life could be eternal. But from my epistemology, the first thing we have to establish is 
how do we tell the difference between that is a part of the world and reality and not just a part of our imagination? Because there's lots of things a part of our imagination that are not a part of reality. And so why would we think that that experience is one of those things that's actually a part of reality and not just a part of our imagination? Now, I use the methodology or the empirical method to differentiate between these two things. And by the empirical method, that only seems to qualify as one of the imaginary things. Now, of course, there could be other methodologies I don't know about yet, but you would have to provide me with that other methodology that we can use to differentiate between imaginary and this other realm. And until you provide that, then I can't really see any reason to think this isn't just one of those imaginary things. Yeah. I want to try the empirical approach with you. I don't think it's going to work, though, because you don't have a lot of confidence in the material world. But uh, should I try it on you and see how it works? Sure, go for it. Okay, so the easiest approach is to just say there's a heat death coming, it hasn't arrived yet, therefore God exists. And to flesh that out a little bit more, we just have to do a reduction to absurdity where we say, well, maybe there is no first cause, right? So let's say there is no first cause. Well, that just means that nature, matter energy distributed throughout space time, has no beginning. It's always been here. So that means infinite time behind us. But we know that there's not infinite time behind us because of entropy. The heat death is coming. It hasn't arrived. Therefore, there's finite time. Therefore, there is a first cause. So then we, we can, oh, then sorry, we can ask. A, I'm losing you a little bit here. So entropy says that uh, entropy is increasing. So all the energy in the universe is boiling down, which means we had a beginning. That's You're talking about the Big Bang, essentially, that there's some some beginning that the universe had, so it needs a first mover. Is that essentially the argument? Yeah, I, I don't limit it to any particular model of a single Big Bang universe or multiverses or string theory. They all have the same property that they are spatial and temporal, and we cannot separate the temporal from the spatial. So what the natural world is, regardless of the model, doesn't matter which model you want to use, it doesn't matter, you can use all the models. Space and time are united intimately, we can't separate them. And so what nature is, it's matter energy distributed throughout space time. And so if we agree that there's not infinite time behind us, even if they're multiverses, then we have to admit that there's a first cause. And now we can ask the second question, is the first cause perhaps natural rather than being supernatural? Because I want to arrive at the, at the uh, supernatural, obviously. So if we assume the opposite and we say, well, what if it's natural? Then we're right back where we started when we said that there was no first cause whatsoever. Namely, we have a situation where there is this natural matter and energy distributed throughout space-time, and it has no first cause, therefore it has no beginning. And if you combine beginninglessness with the attribute of being temporal, you have infinite time behind you. Not only now, but at every point in time in that universe that is beginningless. So, therefore, we can reject that. Well, the, let me ref, uh, respond to that. The first thing is that just like there could be some supernatural transcendent thing outside of space-time, there can be a natural thing outside of space-time that is also in transcendent in some sense. For example, Nima Akrani Hamad emerge in space-time where time and space emerge from a more natural fundamental property that is timeless and spaceless. So yes, we can. Secondly, there are other kinds of time. You don't need to have just a continuous stream like A theory of time or B theory of time. You can have an incremental kind of time. Like for example, I can count 1, 10, 37, 42, 5 million, and 32. There could be some natural property that can skip between times like that sure. to increment time. I take all of that into consideration, all of that. Everything you said, everything that is atemporal is part of my universe. And when I say universe, that includes every model and every every wacky theory that you want to come up with. It's all included. All of the non-temporal parts are included. Right. So my conclusion is, is that if you assert anything that's supernatural or transcendent, like a god, I can do it with a natural thing exactly the same. No, you can't. Because if you're admitting that it's natural, but you're denying that it's temporal, then it still fits into my space-time. It has a place in space-time. You've just put it adjacent. Well, no, no, no. Space-time only applies to our universe. Space-time is our kind of specific time. It is not all kinds of time. So that doesn't work. No, but you, what, you're, what you're not understanding is that the only thing that I'm looking for is a beginning. So if you want to cram all sorts of non-temporal stuff into your model, that doesn't bother me in the slightest. There's plenty of room for the non-temporal natural, if you want to posit a non-temporal natural, there's all the room you need in my universe, my natural universe. You can cram it all in there. It takes absolutely zero time to get past that. So all the time you want to spend suggesting to me that there's this non-temporal component of reality, I say, don't spend time trying to convince me because it takes zero time to traverse that to get from where the universe started to where we are now. 
But the difference between that model of the universe and having a supernatural first cause is that the supernatural is not temporal, it's not spatial, it's not composed of parts. Okay, let me just stop you there. I can say there is a part of nature we haven't discovered yet, which is not spatial, not temporal, and is not changeable. But all of those parts are, number one, undetectable. Occam's razor can get rid of them right away. And they don't interfere, even if they're real, they don't interfere with the process of getting here like you and i are here now but we could not be here now if we had to wait for an infinite number of spatial temporal events to bring us here but that's immediately false so i can say that's wrong immediately because that's only if the a theory of time is true and there are many infinitely many other alternatives that have solved that problem so that that immediately is false no it's not false it, it is not false you're trying to introduce something which i'm allowing into my model of the universe but it's completely irrelevant because it doesn't take time the stuff that you're introducing is hassle-free. Do you understand? Like you're introducing completely hassle-free, low, low maintenance parameters of reality because it's no, not no, no, temporal. No, no. It's us, not temporal. Let me, let me interrupt. Anything you can insert with supernatural can be done with an unknown natural that we just haven't discovered yet. There's no limitations here. No. So you'd have to prove that there is some way that the unknown natural cannot potentially, it is impossible for it to have some feature which is a provable feature of the supernatural. No. What you're saying is that there's part of nature which is non-spatial, non-temporal. I've got two options on how to deal with that. One is to say it's not actually natural, it's supernatural, that's my god, right? That's one option. The other option is to say, if it is natural but not spatial and not temporal, Occam's razor takes care of it. It doesn't interfere with our causality. Here here in this universe, we have causality, and it's always spatio-temporal. Again, again, that's already been proven wrong because I provided a physics theory that does exactly that. So that's wrong. So you can't use Occam's razor to rule out a non-spatial, non-physical, non-temporal natural thing because that we already have physics models that do that so and the next thing is is that anything again there is you've provided no difference between your supernatural thing and my natural thing my unknown natural. if there's no difference then it's god how's that <laughs> if there's no difference it's no, god no, no. <laughs> well, mine doesn't have consciousness mine has no consciousness it's just some natural phenomenon with an unknown do you world. have consciousness yes i have consciousness okay can an effect be greater than its cause or more perfect than its cause that is an incoherent question i don't even understand it if a billiard ball with a certain amount of momentum hits another billiard ball that is stationary. Are, are you arguing that... You can't give what you don't have. You cannot give what you don't have. Right. That's the composition division fallacy immediately wrong. So I can say that hydrogen and oxygen molecules, none of them have the property of ocean, but if they combine enough of them with enough force, they become an ocean. No brick has the property of wall. If you keep adding bricks together, you'll get a wall. No hydrogen mo molecule has the property of sun. If you keep adding them together, you get a sun. So there's no problem with an uh, unknown natural process creating consciousness as an emergent property. You're trying to obfuscate by bringing in this idea that we can have an emergent property that's not a strict accounting of one brick plus one brick or one grain of sand plus one grain of sand, and when is it a heap? We all know these paradoxes, but the difference is that God is not just a bigger, better thing. He's not a thing oh, at yeah, all. I'm not quite following. So my argument is, is that consciousness can be a, an emergent product of other physical things. And those other physical things can be created by pantheism. So I'm not, I'm not following exactly what your argument is here. Well, if you're talking about pantheism, then you're talking about God. You're talking about God is everything. No, I'm talking about an eternal, powerful nature. If you'd like, I can pull up the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy on it to show you. Are you denying that theism is part of pantheism? That is correct. One of the versions of pantheism is physicalism and natural pantheism, which is just an eternal, all-powerful nature. Okay, okay. It started with the Stoics in Greece, and the more modern version is the scientific naturalistic version that I'm referring to. So there's also Einstein, Spinoza was a pantheist. You're arguing that Spinoza did not believe in the supernatural, is that what you're saying? No, I'm not. I don't care about, again, history is irrelevant here. So you, you made an argument that the thing cannot give properties that it doesn't have or something along those you lines. You can't give what you don't have, yeah. Right. And I said consciousness can be an emergent property of physical things, which are created by pantheism. So it seems like I can solve that problem pretty easily. And so it seems like this undiscovered natural pantheism can act as a necessary source of reality, just like a supernatural being could, but without the consciousness. So you don't see any problem with having infinite time behind us in a natural world? No, there's no problem at all, as long as you know how to solve those problems with the other features of nature, the other laws that we can introduce. Can you explain to me, in with a linear infinite past behind us, how it came to be your turn to exist? How did that come to be? Exact same way as counting. I can count from 1, 10, 50 million, 750 million, 2 billion and a half. You can just, you can interval counting. If you have some metric of time that can interval 
like we can interval and counting. Any independent point in time can be arrived at. So there's no problem with that at all. Yeah, but we're not numbers. We are in space time. That means that we can say between now and now, we could slice and dice that on the number line, but we cannot actually slice and dice it in terms of space time. We cannot divide it infinitely. Right. And I'm saying we can. There could be a fundamental part of nature that we haven't discovered yet, which does in fact control time in that sense to be able to divide it infinitely and to be able to iterate it and select a particular point at which it wants to begin like a big bang or something. There's like a part of nature that picks a number, then picks a different number and starts the universe here, or picks this number and starts the universe here. Just like I can pick a number like 337,225. There's just a part of nature that picks the number. So there's no, even though there's infinitely many numbers prior to that number, it still just picked the number. But not a sequential number? No, I did. It just picked it at random. So it's like, it's not sequential. It just said, I'm going to start at this number. Done. Okay. Okay. Is there any modification of causality or no? I would not say so. I'd just say there's an intermediate causality that causes things in a different realm of time. So there's like a, a different dimension of time that has an extra layer of causality to it. It's, but it's still causality. It's still just cause and effect. Okay. But I'm going to have to go away and think about uh, your, I like your random seed idea. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, is That's not your idea? It is my idea, yeah. Oh, copyright. It's the C, I call it the C theory of time. That's pretty cool. First time I've encountered that. Do you have a lot of uh, original ideas? Yes, I do, unfortunately. Wow. What's your IQ? I have no idea. I haven't had an IQ test. Take a guess. Average or above average? Slightly above? Probably above. I'd say moderately above. So do you like playing chess and stuff like that? I do. Are you good at it? Um, sometimes. <laughs> I'm good at it I'm when not, I'm winning, yeah. Do you get emotional? I do. Uh, I'm very competitive. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about hard determinism. What do you think of it? And what do you think of uh, one of my pet peeves, which is compatibilism? I really, really, really despise it. And I don't understand why anyone finds it attractive. Can you talk about hard determinism and then compatibilism, please? Right. Compatibilism is just a form of hard determinism, just relabeled. So hard determinism just means there is everything is determined by the previous causes. There is no kind of interdeterminacy, free will kind of thing. And I think that that is the most reasonable conclusion, but I can't prove it. It's definitely possible there's a free will, but I don't have any reason to believe there is. And as far as I know, Free will doesn't seem coherently possible. Like I don't see there's a way to define what free will could possibly mean. It's kind of like saying the square root of a pork chop. Well, there's one thing you're missing, I think. What's that? Honey mustard. <laughs> the square root of pork chop? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the log of honey mustard, I should have said, would have been a better joke. Yeah, yeah. But um, what do you think about reason? Do you think that reason requires free will? Because that's my firm conviction, and that's the teaching of the Catholic Church, that if you do not have free will then you're just like any other calculator or counting machine or a computer. Right. I would agree, but I would still classify those as reasoning, forms of reasoning. So from my perspective, the reason people are compatibilists is because if you define something from the bottom-up perspective, they are free in the sense that there's some difference between a rock and a person. And so the rock is not free and the person is free just by the definition of the difference between these two, even if metaphysically, the person may be just as unfree as the rock. So if you start from the bottom up perspective, and you just define things by their differences, you can still have all those meaning and purpose and freedom, but not in the metaphysical absolute sense that theists are looking for. And I don't think that really exists. That metaphysical sense isn't something we really have access to, other than just I think, therefore I am. The reason I don't like the idea of free will is because I can't understand it. So from my perspective, Either everything is done for a reason, in which case it's determined by the reason, or it's done for no reason, in which case it's random. Now, I see no way to escape that paradox. It seems to me to be a true true dichotomy. So how do you define free will, or how do you get out of that paradox? I say that there are no exceptions ever to the principle of sufficient reason. It's universally valid. There is no exception. There is a perfectly reasonable explanation for absolutely everything including our freedom, including the finite, the mystery of the finite. It was so clear to me when I discovered that God is God. It was so clear to me that my own finite existence is more astonishing and more miraculous than the existence of God. So it's a sort of inversion of what, what an atheist would typically think that a theist would experience. I think that from the outside looking in on theism, you and other atheists would probably say that uh, I live a humdrum life 
and that I deluded myself with this idea of God, a big man in the sky, and he's perfect, and he's loving, and blah, 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 okay? That's not what the experience is like, or at least not for me. What I experienced is that God is normal. God is ordinary. I am extraordinary. I am mind-boggling. I am bewildering. And not only that, I am paradoxical. I should not exist. God should exist, but I should not exist. It really is hard for me to convey this astonishment, this role reversal to you, but can you just give me uh, your first sort of impression, and then will you promise me that you'll go off and think about it? Oh yeah, I actually thought a lot about that. That seems a lot like the divine aseity argument from either Anselm or Aquinas, where they make the same kind of thing, that God is perfectly simple, and uh, he is the absolute perfect simplicity. I don't know exactly how to express it, but yeah, I've definitely heard that before and thought about it, but I don't see any reason to believe it's anything more than an idea. I don't understand why that would be more reasonable than the inverse. Why, why not just think God is the most complicated thing as opposed to the least complicated thing? There's definitely either one is possible, but I don't see any reason to prefer one over the other. I have a view of objective morality. I believe in objective morality. But one of the reasons I don't believe in the Christian God is because of the problem of suffering and that because of my objective morality, the world that it describes is, would define the Christian God as objectively immoral. So, so my, defi- my definition of objective morality is any involuntary imposition of will is immoral. So the best of all possible worlds, the objective moral standard, is a world where every being has total freedom over their will and t- no being can impose their will on any other without consent. So essentially, everybody gets their own universe. You can do whatever you want. If you want to visit somebody else's, they can invite you and you can go to their universe. Um, and you can be in a world exactly like this one, but you have to voluntarily choose to do it. And no one who doesn't want to be here would be forced to be here against their will. Now, from my perspective, that would be the best of all possible worlds. And if there really was an all-good, all-powerful God, that's the world that would have created. And because we don't live in that world, I can I personally rule out the idea of an all-good, all-powerful God. <laughs> yeah. Any God that you are convinced you're superior to in any way is a false God. That's one thing that's for sure. And the other point I would make is that you might be wrong that's something to bear in mind, right? Oh, absolutely. You might be wrong about a lot of stuff. <laughs> but would, would you agree? If the world, if everyone did get, was given the option, you could choose to live in this world that we know here with all the pain and suffering, or you could choose to go to your own universe. Wouldn't that way the world could be be a morally superior way? Just intuitively, you could be wrong, but intuitively, doesn't that seem like a much better moral way the world could could have been? No, I don't. I don't. I don't see it that way. I see. I see risk and danger when we have free will, and that risk is the abuse of free will. It's an ugly, ugly thing, always. And to imagine some sort of safe space universe scenario, I think is immature, childish, naive. Uh, I'm not saying these things about you, I'm just saying we're not children. You know, we, we have to take responsibility and we have to make better choices. And we find ourselves in a big, complicated, hot mess and that's reality. I think it's better to deal with that reality head on than to say, well, if God were nice, he would give us all a perfectly safe space to play in. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. I totally agree. But I'm not, not arguing for freedom of choice. You should have the right to choose to go to a safe space, or you should have the right to choose to go to this world with the consequences, or you should have the right to choose to go to a world that's even more difficult with even more suffering if that's what you want. From my perspective, morality is the freedom of choice. And if you're forced in this world against your will, that seems to be the definition of slavery. And so if God did create us and put us into this world deliberately without our consent, that seems to be by definition slavery and by definition immoral. So we can say there isn't an all good, all powerful God. So I totally agree that suffering is fine and responsibility is fine. But the only difference is, is that those things have to be consensual. They can't be forced on you against your will. Doesn't that seem like a morally better option? No, I would paint a different picture altogether where instead of a master-slave scenario, I would look at it as parent and child. So a parent brings a child into the world against their will, but the child by his very nature owes the parent love and respect and obedience. That's it. It's that simple. And of course, we have examples, sadly, of parenting, which is subpar, to put it mildly. And so it's easy to project that onto God the Father. But the parent-child relationship is a good analogy. Uh, An even better analogy is husband and wife. You know the magical feeling of seeing a beautiful woman that you're attracted to, and uh, I don't know if you're married or what, but 
when you pursue a woman or you're being pursued by a woman, sometimes that happens, there's a whole dance and a ritual and it's all very mesmerizing and you get swept up in it. And it, there's more to it than emotions. I think you'll have to admit there's more to it than just emotions and hormones. There's more to it. There's something more, especially when sex gets involved. It's very, very powerful. It's very spiritual. It's very mystical. So this is how I view religion. It's much more a romance than it is about a big alien bully in the sky doing a fun experiment at my expense and laughing at me. You know what I mean? Yeah, but uh, romances have to be consensual. So again, I would say that I think it should be up to the individual to decide for themselves what is valuable. I think it's immoral to force upon them a relationship they didn't consent to, because that would be more something like what I was saying earlier, like slavery. If you're forced into this relationship or into this uh, situation where you have to seek that kind of a relationship, that seems unconsensual. And so it's less like a relationship, more like a servant master kind of thing. And even in the case of the parents you mentioned, the the parents, I think, would also give the freedom of their child to go to a world of their own choice if they could. I think most parents would give their child that option instead of forcing them to experience suffering in this world day by day. And I think that's what most parents do, in fact, that they try to earn a living so they can give their child a better life than what they had. So it seems like, from my perspective, that it's more moral, that it is morally superior to give people the option to choose for themselves whether or not they would want to experience the positives and negatives of this world as opposed to the positive and negatives of a different world. The way I would cut through all of this speculation is just by saying that we have a human nature. God is not stupid. He made us for a reason. He made us with a nature and he made us with an end in mind. And that end is the same as the source. The end is God himself. We are made to be eternally happy with God. The objective of life is eternal happiness, infinite, never ending fulfillment, joy, bliss, pleasure, everything. If you want to twist that into some sort of big bully in the sky, making people do things against their will, then you're just wrong. We are made by an all good God and we're made to have perfect fulfillment, bliss, joy, peace, orgasmic pleasure in every in every capacity that's possible in more ways than we could possibly ever imagine. Well, I mean, even if I uh, made my child eat ice cream or something or play video games, like if I forced them to do it against their will, even if it's something joy or happiness, that's still slavery. For me, it seems like the, the higher moral value isn't the joy and the happiness. It's the freedom to choose for yourself because that's what I see as the highest moral standard is the freedom, not the joy. So even if God created us deliberately for his intention that we didn't have any say in, I didn't get to choose this purpose. He gave it to me against my will. That seems to be immoral compared to just giving us the freedom to choose for ourselves. I want to ask you something that's related, but obliquely. It has to do with the perfections. I believe, and the ancient philosophers also believed, that all of the perfections lie in one and the same direction because they all come from one and the same source, which is commonly called God. But leaving God out of the question for the moment, one of my favorite thought experiments to ask atheists is about the direction of the goods? Do they all lie in the same direction? For example, is it possible to move towards pleasure and at the same time be moving away from health? The obvious answer is, yeah, if you only eat jelly donuts, your health is going to decline. But at a deeper sort of platonic level, I think that you will admit that pleasure is good. Even the Epicureans made distinctions between the higher pleasures and the lower pleasures. And so there are those distinctions that need to be made if we would pursue the highest good in pleasure. And that highest good in pleasure will correspond with the highest good in health and so on and so forth. So we're always choosing goods. And when we move towards justice, we're moving towards mercy. And when we move towards truth, we're also moving towards beauty. You know, we cannot leave behind a perfection when we pursue any of the perfections. Do you agree with that? And if not, why not? No, I would disagree with that. I would say like using your jelly donut example, if I'm in the matrix, I can eat as many jelly donuts as I want and I can just program it to not make me fat. So I can have as much joyous jelly donut pleasure without any consequences of fatness. Or to use a more extreme example, in video games, there's lots of killing and stuff, but no one actually dies. So you can do as much murdering as you want in a video game with no consequences towards the or loss of the other perfections. So I would say that they're the really the only standard of morality is freedom and you should be able to free to do anything you want with your universe regardless of whether it's one of the stoics minimal pleasures or maximal pleasures makes no difference i don't see any scale there at all i just think the standard is freedom and you should be able to free every individual every being should be free to choose for themselves what they do 
I don't know if you're aware of the fact that God is freedom itself and that uh, that's just one of the many infinite perfections that he is. I mean, like I said, he is identical with his attributes and those attributes are identical among themselves. It's only here below in this finite world that that sort of pure white light is put through the spectrum and we see the different colors differentiated, right? But freedom is if you want to say the goal, it is the goal of my life, it is the goal of your life. And it's all about orientation. Are you going to orient yourself toward freedom or away from freedom? And from my Catholic perspective, if you're not orienting yourself toward God, then since God is freedom, you are orienting yourself away from freedom, whether you know it or not. The goal shouldn't be freedom. Freedom should be the starting point. It is a starting point. It's immoral to take that away from people and to force them to try and strive for it instead of just giving it to them. If more, the standard of morality is that freedom, so it should be what everyone starts with immediately. And then all the other perfections can be whatever the goals you define your own goals. So for me, the taking away of that freedom or not providing that freedom to each individual is objectively immoral. It's slavery, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Many of my daily prayers involve committing myself to slavery, slavery to Jesus Christ, slavery to the Blessed Virgin Mary as a way of enchaining myself to the God-man Jesus Christ, and all of this uh, with a view to being enslaved to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And in a way, I'm enchaining myself to the Vicar of Christ, the Pope, and the bishops and the church at large. So there's a lot of talk of slavery every day in my prayers. I also pray for happiness every day. I also pray for sorrow every day. Happiness because of the grace I received and sorrow because of the sins that I commit. So it's a mixed bag of freedom and slavery, joy and sorrow, and it's a complex religion and a very complex life with a lot of choices to be made along the way. But the ultimate goal is freedom and happiness and joy and fulfillment and pleasure and all the things. All the things that I want, you want, right? Do you agree with that? Yeah, I totally. I see no problem with uh, your way of life. If that's something that you choose and you voluntarily partake in, that's no problem at all. My problem is with the people who don't voluntarily participate in that and who have been forced to against their will. That's the only problem I have. So I, if you wanted to choose to live in this world and be a Christian and experience all the suffering, go for it. It's totally within your right. You have every right to do that. The problem is, is that even God does not have the right to force anybody else to do it against their consent. That, to me, is objectively, clearly immoral. And so I, that's why I think that pantheism is an atheistic God, where there's just an impersonal universe who doesn't care about us at all, than a personal being who actually is loving and wants good things for us. Yeah, it would seem, uh, not to denigrate your intellect, but it would seem that you're either unable or unwilling to hold intention these sort of paradoxical opposites like freedom and slavery, yes and no, uh, joy and sorrow. And uh, in, the, in Catholicism, there, there are a lot of both and solutions to choices where even Protestants would say one way or the other, you know, like grace or free will. Calvin said, well, it's got to be grace, and he sacrificed free will, and uh, other people go the other way. So there's a lot of tension in Catholic theology and Catholic philosophy that is unresolved, but I think you'll admit that uh, the beauty of any stringed instrument, certainly, if not all instruments, resides in the tension from which flows the beautiful music. But uh, what do you have to say about tension and beauty? Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. It should be up to the individual to decide what is a beautiful way to live for them. And so they should be given the right to go to their own universe and decide for themselves what they find beautiful. And they should not be coerced into a situation where they have to follow someone else's standard of beauty, even if that standard is more right or more objectively true, like a God standard. I see that that is still immoral. Even if it's true, it's still immoral to force them to abide by that against their will. And they should be given the freedom to choose their own way of living in their life. Because I don't see a contradiction between these two things. I think that you can give someone their freedom to choose their own view, value of beauty, even if there is a more objectively better standard of beauty. So I don't think that there is a true dichotomy between these standards of like freedom and slavery. So I don't see there's any real contradiction between the, the things that you're presenting. I think they're all possible, especially if you have the power of a God to make all of those happen voluntarily. If you were to come to believe for whatever reason that God is real, the God that I worship is real, would you choose to love him and to serve him and to try to get to know him in this life? 
or not? Um, if I believed as you did, I probably would. But with my background knowledge, probably not. But I would still say he would be immoral to force people into that situation against their will. <laughs> You've heard the expression mansplaining. Have you heard that? Yes. I've come up with this other term called godsplaining. Do you know what that might be? I imagine it's probably the opposite where it's like someone's trying to explain something to a god or something. No, it's where God just shows you and you go, ah, I get it. So he doesn't say anything. But you see, you see that, oh boy, I was proud and I was rebellious. And uh, no, you were right, God. You're amazing. I love you. Thank you. That's what God's planning is. It's like just showing you reality, the metaphysical ultimate reality. And you just going, wow. Thank you. Amazing. I'm sorry. Please help me. I love you. Thank you. It's just, it's just, you just gush when he shows you even a glimpse of his reality. So that's what God's planning is to me. This is a, an idea I've been playing with. And uh, how do you normally wrap up your show? Uh, just thanks for coming on. I really enjoyed our conversation. You gave me a lot to think about. Um, I'd love to talk with you again sometime. Sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, you're a fun guy to talk to. You have a lot of fresh ideas. And uh, send me some links if, you, if there's anything that uh, you want me to follow up on or read. Sure, I will do. Uh, thanks. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Talk soon. See you. Bye.